Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. I hate to cut you all short. Um, I'm Chris Hirsch, editor in chief of the Washington and Lee University Journal of Energy, Climate, and Environment. On behalf of the journal, I'd like to thank you all for attending our panel, Nuclear Power and Green Age. As policymakers struggle to meet the challenges of the 21st century, the threat of climate change has become ubiquitous. Glaciers around the world are shrinking. The amount of sea ice in the Arctic Ocean has decreased since the 1970s. The average sea level worldwide is projected to rise up to two feet by the end of the century. And this rise will eliminate approximately 10,000 square miles of land in the United States. According to the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, most of the observed increase in global average temperatures since the mid-20th century is very likely due to observed increases in anthropogenic greenhouse gas concentrations. Some experts predict that anthropogenic climate change is already altering weather patterns. They say hurricanes in the Atlantic are likely to become more intense as ocean temperatures rise. Disasters like Hurricane Katrina will become more commonplace. <coughs> Carbon emissions, whether resulting from transportation or energy production, are one of the main culprits behind anthropogenic climate change. In 2007, 85% of US energy consumption was produced from burning coal, oil, or natural gas. Only 8% came from nuclear energy. And some of y'all might have heard a little bit about the, the nuclear renaissance, and that's partially why we're here today. It's no secret that the United States, if, if we're gonna be serious about combating climate change, we must either make significant cuts to our energy consumption, or we have to seek carbon neutral alternatives to fossil fuels. Nuclear energy is attractive for many reasons. It's carbon neutral, it's clean, it's concentrated, and it's powerful, and nuclear fuel is also inexpensive and pretty easy to transport. Most of all, some developed countries such as Japan or France are already satisfying virtually all of their energy needs with nuclear. Yet, nuclear is not without its drawbacks, as we all know. The U.S. has a cumbersome licensing and regulatory framework. And due to this, nuclear startups take years before they ever produce their first kilowatt hour of electricity. Consequently, the startup process is costly, and that makes financing nuclear projects extremely difficult. Compounding nuclear's woes is a lack of apparent options for storing its waste products that nobody seems to want. And we're lucky to have here three experts on nuclear power. Our very own Professor Alpar is Professor of Practice at Washington and the University School of Law. And he will be speaking about the difficulties imposed by the current licensing and regulatory framework. From across the woods, we have Dr. Frank Settle. Dr. Settle is a professor of chemistry at Washington Lee University, and he's an expert on all things nuclear. He's going to be speaking about the nuclear energy side. <coughs> and our last speaker, Mike Bowser, is deputy general counsel for the Nuclear Energy Institute. He's currently representing the nuclear industry in federal waste disposal litigation. Um, Mr. Bowser will speak about what happens to nuclear fuel when, when nobody wants it. Our first speaker, Al Carr, spent his career in the field of energy law. Beginning in 1971, as a trial attorney in the office of general counsel for the Federal Power Commission, which is the predecessor to the current Federal Energy Regulatory Commission. He then took a position as a trial attorney in the regulatory division of the office of general counsel of the U.S. Atomic Energy Commission, the predecessor to the current U.S. Nuclear Regulatory his primary duty was the trial of cases for the licensing of nuclear power plants. In 1976, he left government service and entered private practice in Washington, D.C., representing clients before FERC and the NRC in matters involving the regulation of natural gas, electric, and nuclear energy. In 1981, Mr. Carr joined the legal department of Duke Power Company in Charlotte, North Carolina. While at Duke, he represented Duke Power and its subsidiaries in a variety of matters related to federal regulation of the electro electric utility industry. From 1981 to 1993, he was responsible for, among other things, regulatory matters for Duke's seven nuclear units, including contested licensing proceedings for Duke's Catawba nuclear station that lasted for more than four years. In 
1998, Mr. Carr retired from full-time employment as Deputy General Counsel of Duke Energy Corporation and continued for several years to represent Duke and other clients in energy, regulatory, and legislative matters. He has recently participated in several national studies and analysis of and given presentations on the potential revival of the domestic nuclear power industry. In the fall of 2000, Mr. Carr, as an adjunct professor of law at Washington and Lee University School of Law, began teaching a course in federal energy regulation. The course has been incorporated now into the law school's third year program, and his title is now Professor of Practice. Most recently, Mr. Carr has become of counsel with the international law firm Duane Morris, working with the firm's energy and construction departments in developing a nuclear licensing practice. Mr. Carr received his Bachelor of Arts in English from the Virginia Military Institute in 1966, of which he's very proud, and is a Juris Doctor from Washington and Lee in 1971. A veteran of the United States Marine Corps, Mr. Carr is a member of the Virginia, North Carolina, and District of Columbia Bars. Mr. Carr and his wife, Gail, have two grown children and live in Lexington, Virginia. So, without further ado, Mr. Carr. Mid-70s, 
south, the costs from the nuclear plants are about 25 to 30 percent of the average power cost. Now, what have and can we do to increase the operation and output of the present plants before we even start talking about a new generation? The first thing that we do, that we can do, is look at extending the current operating licenses, which were issued originally for a 40-year period of time. And that period of time was not based upon any safety concerns. It was based on the supposition that the energy would be so attractive and so low, low cost that there had to be a limit on the amount of time the license was good for to give access to competitors to move into the field or get access to the power. In addition, when we talk about extending the life of an operating license, we're not talking about a plant you start up and walk away from for 40 years. There are constant inspections, <coughs> maintenance, and replacement of systems that show, uh, show wear and consideration or, or become a concern during the life of the operating plant. We've already had 59 plants that have been graduated or, or granted 20-year license extensions. We have 21 reactors that have filed for, for life extensions, life license extensions. Some of those applications are being contested. And in all, when we finish the process, we hope to have 98 out of the existing 104 with uh, operating license extensions in 20 years. So that in itself is significant. But more so, when the reactors were originally licensed, they were licensed at a certain megawatt thermal output. That means how much heat does the reactor put out, which, which means how much steam can it generate, which means how much electricity can it generate. Now obviously, if you increase the megawatt thermal output, you increase the steam and you increase the uh, amount of electricity it can generate. <clears throat> we have been, for a number of years, upgrading existing reactors. As you see in that left column there, we've already approved 135. We're going to do 185 total upgrades. Now that's a lot more than 104, obviously, so that means some of the reactors seen one or more upgrades. The key to this is, if you look at the last number on the bottom right in that column, when we get through with the upgrades, or upgrades as they're projected now, we're going to have from these same 104 plants an additional almost 9,300 megawatts electrical output. That's eight to nine additional units as though they were constructed for you separate for the uppers. Now, let's talk about what happened. In the late 60s, early 70s, we had what looked like a vibrant industry. We had a lot of purchases of power plants. The AEC slash NRC uh, back in the early 70s was receiving one to two applications a month to license nuclear power plants. What happened? We're going to talk a little bit about what happened, then we're going to see the changes that have been made. Here's what happened in the 1970s and 80s. First, we had a cumbersome and inefficient licensing process followed by the NRC under the provisions of the Atomic Energy Act. But don't think that was the sole reason. We also had a lot of mistakes and missteps on the supply side of the business. We had incomplete designs, which tied into the problem with the cumbersome licensing process. We had, at times, project management that was somewhat less than efficient and smooth we had extremely adverse business conditions, national economic conditions, 
all of these translated into significant economic regulatory issues. Here is the old licensing process under which all of the 104 plants were licensed. What you had was a two-stage process, required two separate applications. First, you applied for a construction permit to authorize you to construct the plant. At that time, there was a mandatory public hearing required for the construction permit. But what you had was a consideration of whether the site was suitable, what we call the ologies, geology, hydrology, seismology, meteorology, and emergency planning. And you considered environmental issues under the National Environmental Policy Act, Clean Water Act, Clean Air Act, but primarily NEPA. And then you had a reactor design concept. In many cases, the reactor was less than 20% designed at the time the construction permit was applied for. So intuitively, you would think, well, if I'm a member of the public and I want to challenge this, it's very difficult to do without hard technical design issues in front of it. And to a great extent, that was correct. So that hearing tended to focus on environmental and site suitability issues. You had your construction permit issue, and then you designed the plant as it was being built, essentially. In many cases, a system design would precede construction by a matter of just a few weeks. You also had the issue of whether the site was suitable. And you also had, as I said, problems with management. In many instances, utilities would contract with the architect, engineer, constructor, who in turn would contract with other contractors and subcontractors. And some of these projects at the height of construction would have 1,500 to 2,000 contractors and subcontractors on site. An extremely difficult and challenging management environment, particularly in the nuclear area, which is so heavily driven by documentation and records retention as a part of the quality assurance programs. You had massive, massive capital investments. I'll get to that on the next slide. All of that was done. Your construction was essentially complete. And then you had to apply for a license to operate your plant. Now, put yourself in the situation that Mike and I have been in. And imagine that you're addressing the board of a utility. And they agreed to build this power plant a number of years ago. And they watched the money go up, the construction drag out. And then you get to go before the board and tell them, well, next month we're going to file an application to see if we get to operate this plant. So then you had your hearing. There was an opportunity for hearing, and most of these operating licenses were contested. And then when your management problems really came home to roost, if your documentation and records were not in place, you had a very difficult time showing that the plant had been designed correctly and the building was designed. You cut through all the wheat, or excuse me, the chaff. That's the wheat. That was the issue. Once you got through that, you got your operating license and got to operate the plant. Now, what were the problems with this? Well, we talked about unproven design. We talked about business conditions a little bit, but let's expand on that. As some of you may remember, in the early 1970s, we had the first of two Arab oil embargoes by the OPEC country, which sent the cost of all energy skyrocketing, including the cost of electricity. Now, as any Economics 101 student can tell you, which came as a surprise, frankly, to a lot of people, senior executives in the electric industry, when you raise the price of something, the demand falls. 
So the demand for electricity dropped off the table. Because of the regulatory structure, the economic regulatory structure, if a plant's not used and useful, you have a great deal of difficulty in getting it into rate base so you can recover that investment. Well, what do we do? Well, we stretch out the construction schedule. But also, in the early 70s, we had a huge inflationary economy, which drove the cost of the money that companies had to borrow to build these plants way up, sometimes above 20%. Well, as you know, if you own a house, and if you don't, you're going to find out when you buy one. The principal cost associated with any kind of large project is the cost of borrowing the money that you have to carry. A lot of people think the Three Mile Island accident was the sole contributor to the reduction or the dormancy. It was not. These elements were well underway, other way and in place when the Three Mile accident Island accident happened late in 1979. And, but in any event, you had scheduled delays, you had huge cost overruns and increases. Just to give you an idea of the magnitude, the Shoreham plant on Long Island was a single unit, what, like 1,000 megawatt, 900 megawatt plant, somewhere in that range, originally projected to cost somewhere in the neighborhood of $285 million. Its final cost was over $2 billion. So what does that do? Then your economic regulator has to pass that money through to the rate payers. In many instances, these plants, if they had passed them through dollar for dollar, would have caused electricity rates to triple and quadruple. Well, nobody wants that. Um, so we had subst substantial disallowances of recovery of monies invested in power plants to the detriment of utility shareholders. And even when we did get them up and running, got them licensed, we didn't run them very well because we were learning how to run them. We had a lot of shutdowns, we had low capacity factors, and we had lengthy refueling outages. The regulatory compact is important. What that says is all, all of your utilities operate under a franchise from the state. And they have an absolute and unconditional legal obligation to plan for, construct, and operate their systems to meet current and future load. In exchange for that, they're allowed to recover the money is invested plus a return on that investment. <coughs> that didn't happen with nuclear plants. So a lot of people said, and I think rightly so, we're not ever touching that hot stove again. Okay, why is there a revival? Well, we talked about some of it at the outset. We're operating these plants very well now. We have learned to operate. We have a substantial overall need for increased base load generation. And that's what nuclear is best started to do. They're big, and you start them up, and you run them 100% 24-7. And you fill in around it, around your base load generation with your intermediate and peaking units, intermediate and peaking being a lot of your renewables, that kind of thing. We know right now, with respect to environmental matters, what the standards are for nuclear plants. We do not know, and won't know for some time, what they are for coal plants. It's a huge uncertainty there. Natural gas prices, all of our generating capacity in the past 15 years or more, essentially has been natural gas added in this country. As Jim Rogers, CEO of Duke Energy, says, natural gas is the crack cocaine of the electric generator, of the electric industry. The prices are tremendously volatile. You'd be paying $4 per MCF today, and have to pay $18 per MCF next week. 
We have a need for energy security, and we have what looks like increasing public support for nuclear energy. So we've got a hedge against environmental requirements. We've got a buffer against gas probability. We've got strong industry performance. We have relatively stable economic costs, and we contribute to energy security. What have we learned? Well, the first thing we've learned is we've learned how to construct these plants. We learned the hard way back in the 70s. We have learned on a worldwide basis, because although there haven't been any plants built in the United States, there have been lots of them built overseas, Japan, China, France. We've learned how to build them. The second thing we've got is we have a new licensing process. And as the slide shows, it's in three parts. First, we can have an early site approval. Second, and this is most important, we have an NRC certified design for the power plant, pre-approved. And then we have a combined license for construction and operation. That's beneficial from a number of standpoints, including the opportunities for public participation, meaningful public participation. Here's what we've got. First, with respect to the early site permit, if the utility chooses to go that way, there is a public hearing opportunity. Second, design certification. When the NRC is certifying the design, there is an opportunity for public participation. It is not a hearing, as we understand it, in the sense of being an adjudicatory hearing. It's a notice and comment type rulemaking proceeding, which as we know under the Administrative Procedure Act is in fact a hearing. Then we have the application for a combined license that takes all of these pieces and puts them together. Not only is there a public hearing opportunity at that stage, but there's also a mandatory public hearing associated with it. Only when we get this combined license do we start construction. But we have certainty on the front end before we made this massive capital investment. So we, bu we build the plant. You'll see the block there that talks about construction acceptance criteria. And those are what are known as inspection tests and, and uh, what's the other word, Mike? Acceptance. Inspection. I've got it on the next slide. But in any event, you have to demonstrate as construction is being done that you are constructing in accordance with the design of the plan and have met all the quality assurance requirements. Then you get to operate. So what you see here is first, you've got your potential for challenge. The public has its opportunity to participate early on as hard information in front of it. And that all takes place before the major capital investment happens. Then we have the inspections, tests, analyses, and acceptance criteria, ITAC review. Now they're going to be substantial for each unit built. Uh, the numbers I've heard range from 800 to 900 up to 2,000 separate ITAC. And each of those has to be individually signed off on by the NRC. There is a opportunity for public hearing before the plant goes into operation, but it's limited as it's got a very high threshold. The challenger has to prove that the ITAC either have not been or won't be met, and if they aren't met, it's significant. And there's a very tight time frame for that. So this is certainty in the licensing process. So we've already hopefully cured two of the defects. We've learned to build we have a more efficient, more certain licensing process where we don't have to bet the company before we know if we can operate the plant. Now, we also have the Energy Policy Act of 05, which gave us three different um, financial and uh, other assurances. <coughs> and the first is, uh, is loan guarantees. And these are available to uh, generation uh, technologies that emit low or no CO2. Tremendously important because 
it removes a lot of the uncertainty associated with the carrying costs of the money involved. Then there is a production tax credit available to certain plants being brought online. Now, the challenge to that tax credit is nobody would do this if this wasn't available. Well, when you do the arithmetic, what you find out for a two unit uh, 2,400, 2,800 megawatt nuclear station, the maximum tax credit you can get, if there's any still available, is something on the order of 400 to 500 million dollars. When you're looking at a total investment of 16 to 18 billion dollars, that's not going really to encourage you to move into that unknown land. It's nice to have, but my own view is it's not a particularly competitive <coughs> future. Then we've got protection of investment in first new nuclear plants. And what that is, if you can show that your plant is delayed, essentially because of the NRC licensing process and litigation, you've got some coverage amounts shown on the slide, 550 million for the first two, 250 for the second two, costs include debt service, etc. Let me tell you something, young lawyers. If I could pick one case to have to finish my career with, it would be a case under this statutory <laughs> provision. I could live on that for the next 40 years with one condition. I bill by the hour and bill monthly. <laughs> <laughs> this would be more fun to do than a barrel of monkeys. <laughs> <clears throat> okay, in the past, changing regulatory standards and requirements. Now a much more stable process, site design approved. Most important, before you bet the company, you know you're going to be able to operate it. In the past, no design standardization, today design standardization. In the past, very inefficient construction practices we have learned much better. Design as you build in the past, fully designed before we start. This is important. In the past, the public hearing process was cumbersome. Think about it. You had a very limited opportunity at the outset for the construction permit when you didn't know what was going on. And then when you come in at the end, you're facing opposition that sunk two or three billion dollars into a completed, um, a completed facility and nobody is going to listen to you very much. But I would point out that we had three plants in the United States that were essentially constructed that never operated, primarily because of the documentation and the uh, emergency planning issue. And now we have a relatively stable technology. So, do we have an industry revival? Well, let's see. Right now, we have 18 COL applications that have been filed. Review at the request of the applicant has been suspended on five of them. Six reactors are affected there. But these applications have been filed by 20 different entities, construct and operate 20, 28 reactors at 18 different sites around the country. Early site review, six have been filed, four approved. Advanced reactor designs, request for design certification, nine filed, four approved, and five still under review. Things are looking pretty good, so let's see. First need for power. The projections have dropped off over the last couple of years because of the uh, because of the downturn in the economy. Financing, critically important. With respect to individual plants, we need this loan guarantee program. Industry, we are looking first. The electric utility industry is capitalized now in the United States at somewhere between somewhere around 850 billion dollars. The projections are that by 2030, 
the electric utility industry is going to have to invest one and a half to two trillion dollars in generating plant transmission and distribution facilities to meet the load that we project. We are going to be competing, as you know, on a global basis for that money. Just like we're competing now on a global basis for concrete and steel, which is one reason construction costs have been driven up. We have an agency licensing, licensing process that so far seems to be doing very, very well. But we do have questions how it will work on the back end. I mentioned the ITAC process. And this is just me talking, but if there's going to be a hitch, that would be a good place to have one. And we'll simply have to get there to figure it out. Michael probably shoot me at first on that. I said, this is my opinion. Um, spent fuel storage, Mike is going to talk to you about that. Um, that's quite an issue. Decommissioning costs, I'm not quite so concerned about that. That's a technical issue. Uh, each operating plant and plans to operate in the future have requirements where they have to put aside money for decommissioning. And the plants that we have taken out of service, that process and funding has worked pretty well. But those are opening questions, open questions. Now think about this. As I mentioned earlier, a two-unit nuclear plant is going to cost somewhere between 15 and 18 billion dollars. US, U.S. utilities are relatively speaking small enterprises. We're not talking about an Exxon or a BP here. We're talking about companies, the larger ones, that will have a net capitalization of maybe 28 to 30 billion dollars, and those are the big ones. You can see that's half the net capitalization of the company. You go down this path and mess it up, <coughs> you have in fact bet your company. We've got some cost and uncertainties. Um, one of the things that's making, that's allowing these plants to move forward is the companies have been able to meet and reach agreement with their economic regulators in the states to begin to cover some, invest, some of the investment as they put it in. Here are a couple of issues. Infrastructure. The workforce needs new blood. Batman, or am I finished? Good. Ah, okay. The workforce <laughs> needs new blood. You know, we're looking at uh, a workforce where young people have not come in the last 20 years. You know, you've got guys like me and Mike in there now. Um, we've got the new licensing process is untested. We have supply constraints and delays. Some of the components, major components, are made overseas, and that's the only place you can get them. I'm talking about reactor pressure vessel. And we're, um, we have um, a five-year backlog. We don't know about the political situation, um, as Michael tells us about. So a lot of our commitments and investment hinge on the resolution of these. Now, I'm not I'm I'm gonna stop here because I think that gives you a pretty good overview of where we are, where we've been, and where we're going. And if you can show me how to turn this thing off, I'll let you, I'll let Frank get up and talk. <laughs> And I, I think what we planned what we planned on is to have Q and A's after the speaker. Is that right, Chris? Yes. Okay. several local and state awards for teaching and undergraduate research in analytical chemistry. Since that time, he has been a consultant at the Department of Energy and a program officer in the Division of Undergraduate Education at the National Science Foundation. He currently is visiting professor of chemistry at Washington and Lee University where he directs the ALSOS Digital Library for Nuclear Issues. 
and teaches inter interdisciplinary courses on the nuclear age, the role of nuclear power in the global energy portfolio, and the science and politics of weapons of mass destruction. Most recently, he has worked with the National Energy Education Development Program in conducting workshops for middle and high school teachers on nuclear energy. Dr. Settle obtained a Bachelor of Science in Chemistry from em Emory and Henry College and a PhD in Chemistry from the University of Tennessee, Knoxville. He received the J. Calvin Giddings Award for Excellence in Education from the Division of Analytical Chemistry in 2005. Ladies and gentlemen, Dr. Frank Settle. Well, as a chemist, I feel sort of like the filling in an Oreo cookie between two lawyers. Uh, now I don't know. What I want to do is to give you a little bit of the scientific and technical background that, that these guys have presented. They're presenting the legal part, the economic part, and I'd like to just walk you through some of the scientific, technical factors. <coughs> What's been talked about so far has really been is this the gut. We're not the bottom. Okay. We really focused on the reactor part. But if you're gonna if you're gonna look at nuclear power, it's my opinion that you're gonna have to look at the whole nuclear fuel cycle. And this allows you to talk about uh, economics, environmental concerns, and proliferation concerns as well. So the cycle that we're going to talk about, first I'd like to just put nuclear in perspective with other sources of energy. Then I'd like to run through the components of the cycle. And then I think Mike's going to work on the back end a little bit. I'll give you a little technical stuff. Hopefully we'll agree on, on the technical part. Then I'll just run through the alternatives and economics and then the proliferation concerns. So, if you look at global energy sources, now this is all energy. This is where we're getting our energy, okay? Nuclear is a relatively small piece of the pie, to put it in perspective, okay? But it generates on a global uh, perspective, 15% of your electricity. 6% of your total energy, about 15, 16% of your global electricity. Okay, this is the latest uh, energy information agency data. And you can see where, we're, where we've come from and <coughs> where we're going in terms of uh, nuclear. And relative to the other energy sources, it's not huge, okay? And it's not projected to get huge. But it's relatively important. If you took it out, you got a big problem, all right? Now, I tell my kids that this is an important slide, <laughs> okay? And it may have too much information, but I want to point out one big thing, a couple of big things. All right, nuclear generates 100% of nuclear energy is used for electric power. So don't get confused about the oil crisis because oil is not used in general to generate electricity. That's one thing you need to take away. That's one big takeaway. The other thing that's important is that electric power is but probably the largest demand source of our energy sources, which I think is important. Uh, if you look at the chart, you'll see that renewable energy, 11% of our electric power, nuclear is 22%, coal, which I consider one of the most insidious energy sources, 48%, natural gas, 18 and petroleum, only one. So I think that's a really important slide 
to put nuclear energy in perspective. Okay, the fuel cycle. Since I'm a chemist, I'm going to look at some of the chemistry part of it. Uh, if you look, you start out with an awful lot of ore, uranium ore. When you take the uranium ore, you convert it, you have to convert it to a gas, and we'll see why in a minute. Then you have to take the gas and convert it back to a solid and put that solid into fuel rods and then put that, those fuel rods into a reactor. Okay? So that's the, what's called the front end of the cycle. And we'll look at the various steps here. Uranium is a slightly radioactive material, about 500 times more abundant than gold. It's ubiquitous. But if you're going to mine it or recover it, it uh, you have to have a deposit or a percentage somewhere between 1% and 20% of the oxide. Most of the radioactivity associated with uranium is due to radon, which is a gas. Okay, So uranium itself is not all that bad as far as radioactivity goes. Okay? It's mined. Here's a uranium mine. It's mined like coal. You can do, oh, you can do surface mining. You can do uh, deep underground mining. And you can also pump chemicals in and pump uranium out. You can extract it uh, that way. Okay. Uranium metallurgy is pretty much like any other kind of metallurgy: iron, copper, whatever. You take the the ore out of the mine, uh, you crush it, you grind it, you treat it with chemicals, you extract it, and you finally come up with a, a pure oxide called yellow cake. Okay? Remember, you have to process an awful lot of ore to get an awful little bit of yellow cake. We're talking maybe 10, 20 percent. The rest of it is junk that you throw away. Anybody remember these people? <laughs> this is the famous yellow cake incident with Valerie Plain and Joe Wilson. I, I just read this week there's a movie about <coughs> Valerie Plain and Joe Wilson, a brand new movie about their <laughs> escapade uh, with, with yellow cake in the Bush administration. Okay, when you do mining of this type, you're going to have tailings. And this is an environmental problem. More than 200 pounds of byproduct is produced for each pound of uranium. And this is, uranium was mined out in Colorado, particularly during the Second World War. And this is out near Moab, Utah, out west. And you can see uh, there's the pool that's holding the tailing, and there's the Colorado River. So you, you do have some environmental concerns when you process uranium ore, okay? Something that people may not think about when they are focused on the reactors. All right. Um, here's where the uranium is. There doesn't seem to be at the present time a dearth in uranium. So I think we have enough uranium ore to take care of our present demand. The reprocessing people might argue differently. But right now, you can notice one of the interesting things is that Australia probably has the largest amount of uranium deposits, and they have absolutely no nuclear program. They, they don't use nuclear energy at all. Okay? Um, now, we get into the, the chemistry part of this thing. All of you probably avoided science classes as much as good. One thing you gotta realize, natural uranium is composed of 99.2 uranium-238. That's the one that has a few extra neutrons. And only 0.72 235. Now, if we're gonna have reactor fuel, we're gonna have to increase that concentration of the lighter isotope to about three to four percent. You with me? If you want to make a weapon, you keep going and you run your concentration of U-235 up to 90, greater than 90%. Okay? 
Okay? The take home here is anybody who has an enrichment plant has the capability not only to make fuel for reactors, but also weapons grade material for nuclear weapons. And this is where we're worried about Iran. Iran has the enrichment facilities. They claim that they're only running it up to, for nuclear fuel, but it's once you get it up to 4%, it's a lot easier to take it up to 90%. The hard part is getting it up to 4%. It takes much less energy to get it all up to 90%. Okay, so now we know that we have to increase the concentration of U-235 to get it to make reactor fuel. There are two methods of enrichment. I'm not going to talk about the older one because I cut that out. We're constrained by time. The new one is centrifugation. That's what everybody that's building new plants, enrichment plants, they build centrifugation plants. That's what the Iranians are doing. Okay? In order to separate, concentrate this 235, you got to get it, your uranium has to be in a gas phase. Uranium metal is a metal, okay? So you have to convert it to uranium hexafluoride. That's a gas, okay? And when you do that, you do it in fairly large plants. We're not talking about small laboratories. The French, as many of you know, have a very well-established nuclear program that generates about 80% of their electricity. The way you do this is kind of like a washing machine, a centrifuge. You put the gas in the centrifuge, you spin it, and the heavy stuff goes to the outside, and the light stuff stays on the inside. You can't do it with just one washing machine. You have to have a cascade. You have to have lots of washing machines, and they have to be lined up. And as the gas passes from one centrifuge to another, it becomes the concentration of U-235 increases. This is what the Iranians are doing, okay? It's proven technology, low operating cost compared to the previous method. It has molecular architecture. So you can rearrange these things to make fuel or to make nuclear weapons. Okay? So that's a proliferation concern. <coughs> okay, once you en enrich the uranium, the 235, it comes into a plant in cylinders and it goes out of the plant in fuel rods. Okay? And I won't, we won't spend a whole lot of time on that. But you've got to convert this gas back to a solid and put the solid in the form. Here's a tank of gas coming in. Actually, uranium hexafluoride is a solid, but it's, it's a, it vaporizes very easily to a gas. You, you put it in a metallurgical process, you convert to a solid, you make little pellets, okay? These are uranium oxide pellets. And you put the pellets into fuel rods, Fill up your, kind of like putting the M&Ms in a straw or something. <laughs> you, uh, fill up your fuel rod, and then you put your fuel rod into what's called a fuel rod bubble, a fuel assembly, all right? Dr. Sutton, I want everybody to remember yeah. that picture, because that's what we're going to be dealing with on the back end. Okay, good. That's a fuel assembly. There's fuel rods going into the reactor, okay? And there's the reactor. We have really... How many of you are familiar with nuclear reactors? Nobody's going to say they are. <laughs> <laughs> okay, a nuclear reactor basically generates, it's a steam generator, right, Mr. Carter? Yeah. All right, and the part that we're interested in, the fuel rods are here. You have your fission reaction, which generates a whole lot of heat. You take that heat, and notice you have a containment vessel here. This is called pressurized water reactor, and those are the most common reactors. You take that heat, and 
You, you use that heat to generate steam. Take the steam, you turn a turbine, you recycle your water back, generate more steam, turbine turns the generator, and off you go to the grid. Now this part right here, after the water comes from the turbine, you have to cool it before you put it back into the containment structure. And this is where you see the cooling tower. I've noticed on our brochure, everybody says nuclear, and you think of that conical cooling tower, right? Well, all coal plants have conical, or many coal plants. Anybody who's generating steam is probably going to likely have a cooling tower. You do, you can also use a lake. For this, North Anna uses a lake. One of the things that's important to remember is that nuclear generation of nuclear power or coal power or gas electricity takes water. When the lakes go down because of a drought, you have to reduce the output of your nuclear power plant. So I think sometimes people forget about the importance of water in generating electricity. Okay? Here's what happens inside the reactor. A neutron hits this 235. It splits into two smaller atoms called fission products. These fission products are highly radioactive. They're very unstable. You really wouldn't want to meet one on the street. All right? <laughs> now, you have a moderator that slows down Oh, and you also get extra neutrons. The moderator slows it down so they don't go zipping by so fast that they're not attracted to another U-235 and you generate more fission time. Now, remember, only four, three, four, five percent of that fuel is 235, right? The rest of it is 238. Right? The 238 has the ability to absorb neutrons and become plutonium 239. Plutonium 239 has the same property of uranium 235. It will undergo fission. To put it bluntly, you can make bombs out of plutonium 239 as well as 238. You with me? That's important. Okay, what's going on in the reactor? The thing that's going on in the reactor, the 238 is splitting and decreasing. The 239 is being generated, but there are a lot of neutrons around, so the 239 also undergoes fission. Now, about a third of the energy from a reactor is going to come from the plutonium that you made on, in situ. You with it? Now, if I'm a bad guy and I want to make plutonium for my bomb, I'm a North Korean. <laughs> uh, what would I do? How would I operate my reactor? I wouldn't let it run forever because if it runs forever, I'm going to lose all my plutonium. I'm going to push those steel rods out at some, maybe, four to six months after I put them in and I'll have, I'll be able to recover some plutonium. Okay? Now, the back end of the cycle, which Mike will talk about, is basically the material comes out of the reactor. You can do two things. There's an open cycle where basically you don't do anything to it. You either leave it on the reactor site, and we'll talk about that in a minute, or there's a closed cycle where you reprocess. That's an important word, to reprocess. Enrichment, reprocess. Those two words you should remember. That means that you separate out some of the plutonium, you recycle it back into the fuel cycle, and you can uh, burn it in a reactor again. You can only do that one time, however. You can only go through your reprocessing one time. Okay. 
here's what goes into the reactor and here's what comes out. Let's not worry too much about the thing. One thing that's important, you put a lot of uranium-238 in the reactor and you got a lot of uranium-238 out of the reactor, okay? Uh, you generate a little bit of plutonium, not a whole lot, but a little bit. And you generate a few fission products. Those are the things that the radioactive material that happens with these uranium and plutonium splits. Are you with me? Not much, but they're highly radioactive. Okay? There is a spent storage pool for a reactor. And this is pulling the, the fuel rods out of the reactor. Okay. A fairly important slide here. The fission products are red. And notice that their radioactivity decreases fairly rapidly over time. The products that are made but with uranium absorbs neutrons are they decay at a much slower rate. So you have two kinds of waste. You have the fission product, I'm sure Mark will say something about it. They are the highly radioactive material. And then you have transuranium or actinides, which are the radioactivity is much less, and you don't have to worry quite as much about them. Okay. Um, waste is stored in a lot of places right now on site, both military waste and uh, civilian waste. And since you're going to talk about waste, I'm going to move on. Uh, here's a reactor. There's the reactor vessel. What happens about every 18 to 24 months? You replace about a third of your fuel assemblies. You pick them up, and you move them with a crane, and you put them in a pool of water. They are thermally hot. They are very <coughs> radioactive. So you got to put them in that pool of water to cool down. There's a fuel assembly being pulled out, and there's a storage area for spent nuclear fuel. Usually you're, you've got that under what, about 10, 12 foot of water. You can actually swim on top of that. I wouldn't recommend it. But mm -hmm. the, the radioactivity is absorbed by the, by the water. Okay, after about five, four or five years, when it's cooled down thermally, and when those short lives highly radioactive fission products have lost some of their activity, you can put them in dry cast storage and, and leave them on site. And that's basically where we are now. Most of our reactor fuel is either in pools or on site. That's the open fuel cycle. You can transport it. Uh, Lots of countries have come up with lots of fancy containers to transport nuclear fuel around. You can also solidify it. That is, you can capture all this radioactive material in glass. You know how they make glass. You take sand and melt it. Well, just add a little radioactive material in and, and let it cool down and you've got your radioactive material frozen in glass. And that would be the, what you would put in the repositories. Okay. Uh, reprocessing is a is a chemical process. It recovers uranium and plutonium. This picture right here comes from Hanford, Washington. You can see the technicians there, the size of the technician. All the reprocessing is done in shielded places underneath the, the what you see there. It reduces the volume of radioactivity and waste. France, the UK, Japan, and Russia currently reprocess. We do not reprocess. This was a decision made in the Carter administration, carried on by the Ford administration, rescinded by the Reagan administration, but nobody reprocesses because right now it's probably not economically feasible. Okay. This is this is the chemistry. You don't need to worry about that. I don't want to scare all the lawyers. <laughs> <laughs> but you do separate uranium and plutonium in this process. 
This is a plant, this is the French plant at Marcoul. And the reason I show you that, again, this is big time, heavy duty industry. Okay. Relatively, relative cost of this, <coughs> uranium cost when this slide was made, about $2,000 per kilogram. And that's how the cost break down. To mine it, to convert it, to enrich it, to fabricate it, to store it, and then to put it in dry gas storages. You, you probably have some better figures than that. Okay, the last part of the presentation is proliferation. And this is a concern, probably not in our country, but this is what we worry about with North Korea, with Iran, with Syria, with some of these other countries that we don't seem to have good relations or control over. There are two places in the fuel cycle where proliferation occurs and where you can get weapons grade material. One is in the enrichment process as we said before. If you enrich your uranium-235 up to around 90%, then you have the ability to, to build a uranium-235 bomb. That's the bomb that was dropped on Hiroshima. And that's the one that is the easiest one to make. That's the one that if I, you know, if I were worried about it, I think I'd worry more about highly enriched uranium than I would plutonium. The other point in the fuel cycle is in reprocessing. When you separate the plutonium out from the spent fuel and you get this bomb, this bomb that you're looking at there is called Fat Man. Uh, and it was dropped on Nagasaki. The mechanism for detonating the Fat Man is a little more complicated than the mechanism for we won't go into the left. Okay, the uranium complex, their primary facility is at the Tons. This is where they do their enrichment. They have a reactor at Bashar, which the Russians are helping them fire up. That's probably not the worry. The worry is really probably the Tons and other places where they're doing uh, enrichment. And then, if you go to North Korea, uh, the, the name that you want to remember is Yongbin, North Korea. And the North Koreans are pursuing both enrichment and reprocessing. So they're making both uranium-235 and plutonium-239. Okay, um, so we've gotten through everything. We gave you the background, the front end, the service period, which is what, when the fuel's in the reactor, the back end, which Mike's going to pick up on the alternatives and economics and the proliferation concern. The very last thing, I always have to plug our project. If you want to know, <laughs> all you want to know about anything nuclear, go to alcoff.wlu.edu. We have everything in there from nuclear reactors to Japanese poetry. Uh, it, it's a very versatile site. So I would encourage you, if you have to write a paper on nuclear chemistry, something like that, uh, go in there and poke around. It's searchable. I think you'd have a good time. So that's, that's the chemistry. Thank you. Thank you. Our next speaker is Mr. Bowser. Deputy, Deputy General Counsel of uh, Nuclear Energy Institute. Mr. Bowser graduated from Stanford University with a Bachelor of Science degree in Mechanical Engineering. Following five years of service in the U.S. Navy aboard nuclear submarines, he entered Georgetown University, where he received his Juris Doctor degree. Subsequently, he entered private practice and represented electric utilities and other major corporations before federal agencies and in federal courts. This included serving as counsel of numerous contested nuclear power plant, construction permit, operating license, and license amendment proceedings before the Nuclear Regulatory Commission. In 2001, he joined the Nuclear Energy Institute and now serves as Deputy General Counsel. In that capacity, he is currently representing the nuclear industry 
vote the Nuclear Regulatory Commission's licensing proceeding for the Yucca Mountain Repository and in cases currently pending before the U.S. Court of Appeals for the District of Columbia Circuit challenging various aspects of the Yucca Mountain Project. Ladies and gentlemen, Mike Bell. back end of the fuel cycle, essentially what you do with the used fuel that uh, Dr. Settle described, show you pictures of and so on and so forth. And to me, that's important because I often find that people don't understand what uh, high-level radioactive waste, that is, used nuclear fuel or spent nuclear fuel, all, this, all the same, is. I think it's green goo, it's liquid, it's, it just, it, they don't have any concept at all. What it is is what you saw. It's fuel assemblies uh, and made up of individual rods, each containing pellets. Uh, it's these pellets that contain the radioactive waste. They're her hermetically sealed in these uh, zirconium or zircaloy tubes, and they're bound together in assembly form. So it's a very easily controlled uh, material that is very difficult to disperse. You have to work very hard to do it. So. That's, a, that's an important concept. Uh, one of the reasons I want to focus on uh, what you do with this material is it's subject to a lot of controversy. People seem to be very worried about uh, high-level radioactive waste, that is to say, use nuclear fuel or spent fuel. Uh, secondly, um, from a purely legal uh, standpoint, it, it's a good illustration of Administrative law, as handled by federal agencies, have a lot of that going on. Nuclear Regulatory Commission and the Department of Energy, in particular, and it also is a vehicle for judicial activity. We'll talk about that too. There are judicial uh, cases in the U.S. Court of Appeals right now proceeding. So it's it's a it's a nice vehicle to get a handle on some of the legal stuff. And then finally, it has certain political aspects to it. Um, now more than ever, that are kind of sexy, so it has a little bit of um, a little bit of appeal in that regard. We're going to talk about two things: where the United States is today, and where the United States is today is basically operating under the Nuclear Waste Policy Act of 1982, as amended. This is all pretty pretty simple stuff, by the way. There's not a lot of interplay among a whole bunch of very complex statutes and so on. This is the one we're talking about. And what this gives us is the Yucca Mountain Repository Project in uh, the state of Nevada. It's the federal government's facility being developed for disposal of high-level radioactive waste from reactors, again, spent in used fuel, and defense waste that's been generated over the, over the years uh, in support of the defense program, primarily weapons production and uh, U.S. nuclear and Navy uh, spent fuel from their reactors. And then we'll talk a little bit about uh, going from where we are now to looking ahead to tomorrow. Okay, this is where we are now. Um, as Dr. Sell uh, indicated, we have material stored uh, all over uh, the country, both defense material and uh, uh, used nuclear fuel from reactors at reactor <coughs> sites uh, in either spent fuel storage pools, which you saw, or in dry cask storage containers, which you saw. Uh, right now, the inventory, well, this is actually through 2009, is approximately 6,200, 62,500 metric tons of uranium. This increases at a rate of about 2 to 2.4 thousand metric tons annually. Um, so you can calculate over to, to any, any period. Is that a lot? Um, Depends on what you mean by a lot. Uh, if you took all of the used nuclear fuel, all of these assemblies uh, that have been generated in nuclear power plants in the United States over the last 50 years, since the very beginning of nuclear power in the United States, <coughs> took all that material, you could put it on a football field uh, to a depth of about 20, 20 feet. So that's, that's 
one way of looking at it. Another way of looking at it is um, 62,500 metric tons of uranium. A large coal plant every day generates 15,000 metric tons of CO2. One coal plant, one day, 15,000 metric tons of CO2. So you can see that from a mass standpoint, this is very, very small. And it's an easily managed material. If you're trying to capture CO2, first of all, it's a gas. You have to capture the gas. You have to do something with it. You have to store it and sequester it. It's easy to get away with. Uh, it's easy to get away from you. People talk about the nuclear waste problem. I think this is one of our greatest assets in the nuclear industry. The waste material is very easily handled, very easily disposed, relatively speaking. So I don't, again, I don't look at it as a problem. I look at it as a strength of this particular method of uh, electric generation. Uh, dry casts right now, we have about 14,000 MTU. Um, this is uh, in about 1,200 casks. You can read this as well as I can at 49 sites. This will increase over time. Uh, at about 2040, if you just keep adding 2 to 2.4 thousand metric tons of uranium to this number, you see that at about 2040, you get to 70 thousand metric tons of uranium. This, is, this number is significant in that this is the statutory limit for disposal of uh, material at Yucca Mountain. It's purely statutory limit, has nothing to do with the capacity of the Yucca Mountain to uh, receive and isolate this material, but it's, it's a number, it's kind of a figure, figure of merit. Yucca Mountain Licensing. Uh, Yucca Mountain Licensing comes from the Nuclear Waste Policy Act of 1982. That's the only, that's the only statute you have to remember. Uh, it's, it, it's, it's that simple. Uh, the Nuclear Waste Policy Act of 1982 was enacted to find a site for permanent geologic disposal of the used nuclear fuel and defense waste. Um, it provided for uh, standard contracts between the government and the electric utilities generating the waste for the disposal thereof. Um, in particular, in exchange for one mil per kilowatt hour of electricity generated, that's one tenth of a cent uh, per kilowatt hour of nuclear generated electricity, the government was obligated to take that material and dispose of it. This was done again within the confines of a statutorily prescribed standard contract. Uh, the Act provides for the commencement of disposal uh, not later than January 31st, 1998. Uh, that, never, that never happened. Um, in June of 2008, the Department of Energy applied for uh, an application for the Yucca Mountain Repository as required by what? The Nuclear Waste Policy Act. Every, every question I ask about a statute, the answer is the Nuclear Waste Policy Act. Um, uh, DOE uh, applied for a license for the NRC for the Yucca Mountain um, Project as required by the Nuclear Waste Policy Act. Uh, the uh, NRC noticed the availability of a hearing, again, as prescribed by the Nuclear Waste Policy Act. Uh, we had a number of uh, participants seek to participate in that hearing. Um, we ended up with, uh, as full party participants, to the Nuclear Regulatory Commission proceedings with the state of Nevada, um, the state of California, seven Nevada counties, including the host county of the repository, up the mountain, that's Nye County, uh, including Clark County, which uh, is really what most people think of as, as Las Vegas. La, 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 the strip is not in, in Las Vegas, it's in, it's in Clark County. Um, the Nuclear Energy Institute is a full party participant. Inyo County in California, uh, three, the, three Native American entities, uh, Caliente Hot Springs Resort, and uh, there were two Nevada counties participating as interested uh, governmental uh, entities as allowed by the Nuclear Waste Policy Act. Um, 
total of 300 contentions raised to be addressed uh, in this licensing proceeding. A contention is essentially an issue. It's a matter put into uh, controversy uh, for the NRC licensing board to consider and resolve. Uh, we were just getting into active uh, discovery when at the end of last year uh, the Obama administration announced its intention to terminate the proceeding uh, and uh, withdraw the license application from the Nuclear Regulatory Commission. Uh, that was more formally stated uh, within the confines of the Nuclear Regulatory Commission's licensing proceeding uh, and in February the proceedings were stayed, pending the filing of a motion by DOE to withdraw the application, which did come to pass on March 3rd of 2010. Uh, the NRC uh, Licensing Board uh, heard uh, and considered that motion, uh, held oral argument uh, in Nevada, which is where all of these nuclear regulatory commission licensing proceedings um, are taking place, or were taking place. The um, licensing board denied the motion um, to withdraw uh, based essentially on the fact that it did not, uh, was not consistent with what statute? <laughs> Nuclear Waste Policy Act. Um, that motion uh, remains denied. Uh, the Nuclear Regulatory Commission commissioners, the five commissioners themselves, are now in the process of deciding whether or not they will review the licensing board's uh, denial, but that is still pending. In the meantime, uh, the Department of Energy um, essentially shut down its uh, Yucca Mountain uh, project, uh, dispersed uh, everyone who was working on it. Uh, the Nuclear Regulatory Commission's review of the Department of Energy's application by the NRC staff, this is the staff technical review, not the licensing board uh, uh, licensing proceeding. That proceeding, by the way, is a full-blown adjudicatory proceeding providing for direct testimony, cross-examination, or rebuttal. It's just like a Perry Mason trial. Uh, that uh, activity is, has been suspended, as I say, since February. Um, in the meantime, the staff's technical review, separate apart from the adjudicatory portion, was terminated pursuant to an order issued internally by the NRC's uh, Chief Financial Officer and Executive Director at the direction of the Chairman of the Nuclear Regulatory Commission. There is now considerable schism within the Nuclear Regulatory Commission itself, the five commissioners. Uh, Commissioner Ostendorf and Svinicky disagreed. Um, they couldn't get a quorum, however, to overturn the action by the Chairman directing the staff to terminate the proceeding, and that is now the subject of considerable um, congressional interest, and that will increase over the coming Congress because uh, the Republicans are very concerned about the uh, action that was taken within the, within the Commission in this regard. The Chairman, by the way, of the Nuclear Regulatory Commission um, is uh, Chairman Yasko. Chairman Yasko's immediate previous employment was on the staff of the majority uh, leader, uh, Senator Harry Reid. Senator Harry Reid has been a staunch opponent of the Yucca Mountain uh, project ever since its inception, so there are plenty of opportunities for uh, intrigue. So that's what's happening in the uh, administrative uh, arena, uh, government agencies, the Nuclear Regulatory Commission, and the Department of Energy. Now, in parallel to that, you have court action. This is the judicial side of the coin that I mentioned. Administrative action under the Administrative Procedure Act and Nuclear Waste Policy Act, really most directly. And court action, again, under the Nuclear Waste Policy Act, which provides for certain challenges to be brought directly in the U.S. Court of Appeals. Uh, earlier this year, um, four petitions were filed in the U.S. Court of Appeals for the District of Columbia Circuit, uh, seeking parallel to the opposition of the Department of Energy's action before the Nuclear Regulatory Commission, seeking in parallel to have the court issue an order directing that the Department of Energy, again, continue to prosecute the Yucca Mountain application and directing the Department of uh, the Nuclear Regulatory Commission to continue considering the application. Uh, petitioners were Aiken County, South Carolina. Uh, Aiken County, South Carolina is in the southern part of the state. 
Uh, it is home to the uh, Savannah River plant, which is a large uh, government uh, nuclear facility. Uh, second petitioner was the state of South Carolina itself. The state of South Carolina is, has a very, very sophisticated and well-developed uh, nuclear uh, industry and infrastructure. In addition to hosting the uh, Savannah River plant, uh, there are seven nuclear power plants in the state of South Carolina alone. Third petitioner uh, was the state of Washington. Washington state is the uh, home of the Hanford uh, Reservation, which is a large defense facility in the eastern part of the state of Washington. And the fourth petitioner um, in the U.S. Court of Appeals for the D.C. Circuit were three individuals who reside in the vicinity of the Hanford Reservation. Uh, in addition, uh, the uh, Na National Association of Regulatory Utility Commissioners, NARU, which is the Association of State Economic Regulatory uh, utility regulatory agencies came in and intervened in support of the petitioners. The Nuclear Energy Institute filed an amicus brief in support of the, issue, uh, of the petitioners. And the state of Nevada came in as a full party intervener uh, in support of the respondents, the government, the Department of Energy uh, in this case. Um, the case was brought, it is now being held in abeyance pending NRC action on review of the licensing board's decision denying the motion to withdraw, which was issued, as I think I mentioned, last, uh, last June, acting on the uh, Department of Energy's motion to withdraw and terminate the proceeding, uh, issued in March. So that one is pending. Uh, as a bit of a, uh, a side sidebar, um, the uh, National Association of Regulatory Utility Commissioners that I just mentioned, NARU, uh, and the Nuclear Energy Institute have another lawsuit which is pending. It's based on the Department of Energy's denial of NEI's and NARUC's uh, requests for an annual fee adequacy analysis and appropriate adjustment of the fee. Remember I mentioned that the Nuclear Waste Policy Act provided for a one mil per kilowatt hour charge on nuclear electricity. It also provides for an annual review of what the costs actually are of carrying out the project compared to what the one mil per kilowatt hour uh, charge is uh, accumulating in order to true that up on an ongoing basis. When this suit was filed, um, there had been no fee adequacy analysis for over a year, in addition to which, at the point uh, any NEI and uh, NARU requested the uh, Department of Energy to do what was required, there was no project, there were no costs at all. So our position was that uh, these collection of the one milk kilowatt hour fee, which everybody pays here in the state of Virginia, by the way, because they're served by VEPCO, or mo most of you are, um, that that fee be suspended until an appropriate analysis had been done. Uh, DOE denied the requests. Uh, NEI and NARU filed the lawsuits, which are now consolidated in April, again in the U.S. Uh, Court of Appeals for the D.C. Circuit, challenging the DOE's denial. Uh, again, what they said was that the Act requires the adequacy analysis and the adjustment. Without a waste program, appropriate action is to suspend the collection of the fee in accordance with the Nuclear Waste Policy Act prescriptions. Briefs have been filed. Uh, oral argument is scheduled in the D.C. Circuit uh, for December uh, 6th. Um, and I think that's going to be an interesting case. Uh, by the way, um, about $10 billion has been already spent on the repository program which the Department of Energy has unilaterally now uh, canceled. Uh, there's about $24 billion from rate payers in paying this one bill per kilowatt hour fee. In the U.S. Treasury, it hasn't been expended. That generates $1.1 billion a year in interest, in addition to which continuing charge of the one mil uh, fee uh, brings in about another billion dollars. So you have no project yet the government is getting essentially $2 billion a year to do nothing yet, and in, in light of that, they're collecting the fee. The final irony, or outrage, uh, is that under the Nuclear Waste Policy Act, because defense waste goes into the repository, uh, 
the government is required to contribute its fair share for disposal. Utilities contribute through their rate payers, one mil per kilowatt hour. The government has to contribute its prorated share. The current budget request contains no money for the government payments, yet the government is seeking to continue to charge the utilities full freight. Going forward, um, where we are now is not in a very happy position. Uh, what we're looking toward going forward, a couple of elements. Uh, first of all, centralized interim storage, uh, the Nuclear Energy Institute at least thinks is a good idea. Instead of having um, this material uh, in the form of spent fuel assembly sitting around at X number, well, 104 uh, nuclear reactor sites, we think it would be better to centralize the storage. Um, it would, among other things, uh, allow the uh, government to meet its statutory obligation to take and remove spent fuel under the standard contracts prescribed by the Nuclear Waste Policy Act and, have, and allow it to stop paying damages. Almost 100 lawsuits have been filed by, law, by uh, utilities against the government for failing to meet its standard contract obligation to begin taking material not later than January 31st, uh, 1998. Not one stick of used nuclear fuel has been accepted yet. As a result, almost 100 lawsuits have been filed in the U.S. Court of Federal Claims. Total liability has been estimated anywhere between 13 billion and 15 billion dollars. If they started talking, if they stated, if they started taking the material and putting it on a centralized location, they could stem those. The government could stem those damages costs. By the way, guess who's paying all the damages to utilities? It's just the taxpayers. So now we're paying twice. Ratepayers are paying their one milk kilowatt hour. In addition, taxpayers are paying for the government's failure to comply with the requirements of the waste policy. Second, we're looking toward recycling. Um, as uh, Dr. Settle mentioned, uh, recycling could enhance the long-term sustainability of nuclear energy, although fuel right now is not a, is not a problem. Um, it does have certain uh, advantages uh, going forward. Uh, we don't think the current rural recycling process uh, as being uh, carried out by, by France, Japan, and the UK in particular is particularly attractive uh, for a variety of reasons. Uh, some mentioned by Dr. Dr. Settle, it's probably not economically uh, worthwhile. Uh, you do get separation of, under the current process, under the Turex process, you get separation of plutonium and uranium, which has proliferation concerns. But we think in the longer term, there, there are advantages advantage to recycling, among other things, you can reduce the uh, volume of the waste that needs to be disposed of. Um, and still, in any event, though, you're going to need a disposal facility uh, because you will always have, in any form of food processing, some material that has to be disposed of. These, these bad vision products that Dr. Sutton mentioned, there's always going to be some residual that needs disposal, isolation. So we need to proceed with that too, and we believe the licensing process for Yucca Mountain should be completed, even if the facility is not ultimately used, which would be favored its use. But even if it's not, it would demonstrate the regulatory process and, and provide a basis for lessons learned going forward in terms of uh, geologic disposal. And finally, because of the political complications and so on that have come to pass within the Yucca Mountain program under the Nuclear Waste Policy Act, we favor the establishment of a, um, a federal uh, corporation, a separate and apart and somewhat insulated from the political processes, something like the Tennessee Valley Authority, which would provide a stable uh, leadership to um, uh, carry out the program, again, somewhat insulated from all the politics, the, uh, the devil, the uh, Yucca Mountain program for, for decades. Uh, we would under this program is envisioned have a board of directors which would appoint a chief uh, executive officer to actually run the program on a day-to-day -day basis. Uh, those people who come from industry who know the technicalities and are uh, that have a vast amount of experience in handling this material uh, would have to have sufficient funding. Uh, we would support the FedCorp having access to the nuclear waste fund where all of this uh, money has gone in the past from the one milk per kilowatt hour fee and past defense uh, contributions. Uh, there would have to be accountability prescribed in the charter of the corporation uh, to ratepayers and the public, and again, driven by sound business 
bis business practices, not political ones. That concludes my presentation. That's a very good question. Um, the answer is yes. One of the real problems, though, is even though the Nuclear Waste Policy Act requires the project to continue, at least uh, according to the Nuclear Regulatory Commission's licensing board, and the court will decide this question eventually, too, when the D.C. Circuit proceeding is, you can always starve a program by not appropriating money. And as long as the Democrats control the Senate, and as long as Harry Reid is Senate leader, you're not going to get the Senate appropriation funding Yucca Mountain. So I think that's the most realistic answer at this point. Any further questions for any of the speakers? <laughs> Some of the uh, some of it can, some of it probably cannot, given given its current uh, its current state. The, and as you suggested, the federal government stopped reprocessing Navy fuel long ago for reasons that I am not completely sure of, Doctor Settle. But uh, that is, there are no plans to reprocess, as you suggested, the Navy material. That's, by the way, very. Be careful what I say. Navy fuel is is significantly a higher enrichment than the 4 to 5% of the commercial utility reactor. Are there any of the, I guess any of the panels, but when it comes to disposal of the, uh, of the spent rods, um, I, was the, the only, I think the only one that I've ever heard of before is, is the Yucca Mountain possibility. Do the opponents of that have a, a, another idea, or do they just want to keep it on, on site? Or? Uh, Senator Reed's position is that to solve the problem, you simply need to continue to store it indefinitely. Uh, to me, that's sort of like saying if your kid has a behavioral problem, the way to solve it is to uh, ignore it. Uh, it makes no sense, but that's the only answer. There are no all. And additional studies. There is a Blue Ribbon Commission, which was appointed by the President, which is now considering alternatives to managing material out of the back end of the fuel cycle, it will probably report uh, alternatives sometime uh, late next next year, and the Department of Energy will presumably kick, kick that off. If it's any consolation for you, nobody has a permanent repository right now. There are some countries, France, Finland, Sweden, are close. And they have worked very, particularly France, and I think maybe Finland, have worked very carefully with local, regional folks to build a consensus over time. You know, it, it, it seems to me like this Nevada thing has gotten so politicized, so bad. And I think the French have done a reasonable job of, <coughs> of preparing the region and the localities for a repository. They don't even call it a repository. I think it's an experimental or something or another. I mean, it's, it's very well orchestrated. My understanding is that if you moved all the fuel that's currently in the dry casts and the pools and all the defense waste, that basically you'd fill up the Is that accurate? Or? You, would, <coughs> you would to the statutory 70,000 metric ton uranium limit, but there have been studies done by the Electric Power Research Institute which indicate the actual capacity physical capacity of that mountain could be uh, many, many times that, as I recall, up to 250,000 metric tons. But yes, just continuing to operate the, the civilian reactors to 2040, you would hit from that alone 
the 70,000 statutory metric ton annual yield. Now that the uh, nuclear Navy isn't supplying all the, the management for the industry, what are they going to do to find people to take the place of folks like us in the Dr. Sell? Well, that, that's a real problem, all the way from the operator level to the engineering level. One of the things that is happening in Lynchburg, where Ariba has the North American headquarters, and one of the projects I'm involved in is working with primary, secondary, middle school teachers to increase the awareness of students of the opportunities in the nuclear industry. So you're going to have to grow it. One of the interesting things is they'll pay, the community college will pay a student $30,000 a year to get in the, to be in that program. And they will articulate or transfer, they can transfer into the UVA's new refurbished nuclear engineering program. And guess what? The UVA professors are coming to the community college in Lynchburg to teach the courses. People coming out of Jefferson and Charlottesville to, to teach courses in a community <coughs> college. So, you know, I think the manpower issue, and I think Al talked, the other thing is infrastructure, concrete. One of the things that worries me is not so much in this country, but China is building right now, I think 12 nuclear, something, something like that. China doesn't have the best record of quality control. Uh, you know, they may buy their concrete from Halliburton, I don't know. <laughs> but yeah, one accident anywhere, one major accident anywhere in the world, and the, and the industry is back to, I mean, it would be a crushing blow to the industry. So uh, safety is, I don't worry about safety in this country, but I do worry about safety in other countries. There's another plant coming online anytime soon. Where would you expect in the U.S. that plant to be? Uh, Southern Company. Yes, yeah, Southern Company. It's the Vogel plant, uh, not too far from Augusta. It's Commerce, Georgia. It's right across right. the river from Savannah River. Uh, yeah, right, right across the river from Macon. And uh, they are actually, uh, they're, they're first in the queue in the combined operating license. They finished their contested issues. Uh, they are constructing, but not meeting the statutory definition of construction, which is limited pretty much to safety related systems. They've uh, excavated for both reactor vessels uh, down to bedrock, and they're in the process of completing the backfill for that now. Uh, they anticipate a CLL mid next year, Mike? Something, something around year. there. Also, uh, SCANA, uh, which used to be South Carolina okay. Electric and Gas, is building two units again in South Carolina. That'll bring them up to nine, nine nuclear power plants. And one of the things that we talked about, uh, uh, Major Hart, was uh, the uh, early site permit. A number of those reactors or applications that uh, have been filed have been filed to be put on existing sites. So a lot of those issues. So a lot of those issues have been settled, and uh, your, your site review obviously is, is much less at that particular time. Well, Bowdoin's been working on that for how many years? Well, Bowdoin has got two units that have been running since about 1986. Well, that oh, you mean when did while. they start moving dirt? I mean, when did they start filing that? Oh, the application is filed. Uh, about 18 months ago. The application, yeah. 18 months, maybe two years. I'd like to, to thank you all for coming. Stick around for a couple minutes. Just have some other people I'd like to thank. Uh, you've been a great crowd. Uh, please continue to follow us. We're having a symposium. <coughs> In the, uh, in the spring, actually, February 18th. It's uh, going to be on oil and mineral extraction and uh, those industries generally in light of what's happened recently with the Deepwater Horizon plant and also uh, what's going on in West Virginia.
with the uh, mountaintop of Google. Now, um, you can also follow us on Facebook and Twitter. Uh, if you go to our homepage, it's law.wlu.edu and just backslash J-E-C-E. And uh, right on the homepage, you'll see links to our Facebook and our Twitter account. And we greatly appreciate it. If you'll give us some support and follow us. We've just started these up. Uh, we're going to use them as a means to communicate with our um, supporters and with the, with the local community generally and with the broader national community so that we can attract uh, a very broad spectrum of speakers. Um, yeah, see here, down at the bottom. <laughs> Maybe we can make that a little bigger. <laughs> now, uh, before everybody goes, there, there's a lot of people who have really done a lot of work to make all this happen, and I'd like to thank them. First, I'd like to thank our speakers. You guys are great. Mr. Bowser, Dr. Settle, and Professor Carr. Uh, I would like to thank Professor Carr especially, because without him, we would have had tremendous difficulty putting this program on and having the high quality that we've had. <coughs> so, um, and, yeah, and we wouldn't have a program without him, so thank you. <laughs> Next, I'm going to move on and thank uh, Bob Strong, our assistant provost, and the, uh, the director for the Rupert H. Johnson Program of Leadership and Integrity. Uh, without funding from the, from the Johnson Lecture Series, uh, again, this, this program wouldn't be able to happen. Um, I'd also like to thank our, our faculty advisor, Dean Danforth. He's been very intru instrumental in providing essential guidance and support. Our former faculty advisor, Professor Harvey Sosky, uh, she's over at the University of Minnesota now, but she inspired this event and she did a lot early la or late last semester getting it off the ground and getting this moving on. I'd also like to thank Dean for Student Affairs, Sydney Evans, and Lynn Titch, our Law Student Services Coordinator. Uh, they, they provided crucial planning advice as well, helping us to, to dot our I's and cross our T's as, as things came down to a close. Uh, all the ladies and faculty services, they've been great, Wendy Rice, and Mary Hodap, uh, they really lent a lot of assistance and came through whenever we needed help. Um, and they were very patient with us as well. I'd like to thank Technology Services for, for helping us out, uh, putting on the streaming feed and everything else that we've been doing and putting all these links and coordinating all of our websites and Twitter and Facebook accounts. Um, and that goes for our technology people within the journal as well. Book, Brooke Spears, and Barbary for contributing greatly for the wonderful lunch that we had from Blue Sky Bakery. Um, and uh, Jane in the brief stop who made the cookies at the last minute. <laughs> <laughs> um, and uh, we had a, a great amount of contribution from journal members who volunteered to come here this morning, early this morning on Friday, and, and give us a hand setting off. I'd like to thank them. And, and last but not least, uh, I'd like to thank our events chair, Rachel Mack. Um, she worked really hard on this event from start to finish. And really, it wouldn't have happened without Professor Carr, but it really wouldn't have happened without Rachel Mack. Um, <laughs> she was diligent. She paid great attention to detail. If I had questions, she had answers. And her confidence is really my peace of mind. So um, thank you again, Rachel. And thank you all again for coming.